ಹೌದು ಸರ್ ಹಾ Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now 18.30 South African time. Thank you so much for lecture four of this level one course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp and my co-presenter for this evening will be Tom Mukarosi. The format for this evening's lecture will be as follows. I will cover laws 20, 21, 23, 22 and 23. I will then hand over to Tom who will cover laws 24 and 25. And after that, we will then uh, open the floor for the Q&A session. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Those that are, um, can you, Everyone, please just mute themselves if you're not muted uh, yet and switch off your cameras. So law 20, law 20 covers the dead ball law. So what does it mean when the ball becomes dead? There are certain things that will happen on the field of play. And once that particular incident happens, the ball will then become dead. And once the ball becomes dead, anything that happens after that is irrelevant. I will now go through the list of things that will make the ball uh, become dead. Uh, firstly, I will cover when the ball automatically becomes uh, dead. And then secondly, I will cover when it's important for the umpire when an incident happens to call and signal dead ball to indicate to everyone that the ball is now dead. So firstly, I'm going to cover when the ball automatically becomes dead. It is good practice. Lots of players don't know the laws of cricket, even though the law tells us when the following incidences happen, the ball automatically becomes dead, so there's no need to actually call or, uh, and signal dead ball. But good umpiring technique, good practice is to call and signal dead ball when, when it happens, just to inform everyone that the ball is now dead. So firstly, when does the ball automatically becomes dead? When it finally settles in the hands of the wicketkeeper or of the bowler. W uh, the umpires and the umpires alone, they need to judge when this uh, the ball finally settles in the hands of the keeper. Yes, uh, when the dead ball law is an opinion law, so in the opinion of the umpire, that the ball finally settled in the hands of the keeper or the bowler, then the ball automatically becomes dead. As soon as a boundary is scored, whether it's a boundary four or a boundary six, the ball automatically becomes dead. As soon as a batter is dismissed, the ball automatically becomes dead. An example of this, let's say the uh, bowler uh, delivers the ball, clean balls, clean balls the striker. Uh, um, can everyone please mute themselves? I can hear background noise. Thank you so much. Uh, point number three, when the ball automatically becomes dead is when the batter is dismissed. So just an example of this is if you can visualize bowler clean bowling uh, the striker, the, the ball then ricochets from the stumps after dislodging uh, the bales, the ball ricochets towards the boundary and it actually goes over the boundary. Would that be a boundary four? No, it will not be a boundary four. And the reason for that is the law tell us that as soon as a batter is dismissed, from that moment, the ball automatically becomes dead. So as soon as the, uh, the ball dislodges the bales, i.e. the batter is now bowled, the ball automatically becomes dead. Anything that happens after that is irrelevant. The ball automatically becomes dead 
when with a plate or not, it gets trapped between the bat and the person of the batter or between items of the batter's clothing or equipment. The ball automatically becomes dead when it lodges in the clothing or equipment of the batter or the clothing of an umpire. Example of this, if the ball goes into the flap of the, the batter and it gets the lodges or stuck in, into the top flap of the pad, that ball automatically becomes dead as soon as it lodges in the top flap of the batting pad. The ball automatically becomes dead when a player returning without permission touches the ball, and we will cover that uh, later this evening. Also, when there's illegal fielding, the ball also becomes automatically dead. When the ball hits the protective helmet of the fielding side that was placed behind the keeper. So as soon as the ball touches the helmet that was put behind the keeper by the fielding side, the ball then automatically becomes dead. So anything that happens after the ball hit the helmet is irrelevant. The match, as soon as the match is concluded, the ball is becomes automatically dead. So the calling of over or time. So once six valid balls has been bowled in the over, it's then important for the umpire to call over. But when do the umpire call uh, over? The law tells us that the, the umpire first needs to wait the, for the ball to be dead. And after the ball is dead, now the umpire calls over or time. Important thing here is before calling over after six valid balls has been bowled, you first need to wait till the ball is dead, and then you call over. Another instance where when the ball is considered dead, when it is clear to the bowl is in umpire that both the batters and the fielding side have ceased to regard the ball as in play. Then in that case, if both batters and the fielders cease to regard the ball as in play, that ball is also considered to be dead. Earlier I mentioned when the ball is finally settled in the hands of the keeper um, or the bowler, the ball then automatically becomes dead. They're just em emphasizing it here that who decide whether it's finally settled is for the umpires alone to decide whether the ball uh, is finally settled or not. So I've covered now the instances where the ball automatically becomes dead. Again, good practice to call and signal uh, dead ball if uh, certain of these instances happens, like if the ball is the protective helmet, call and signal dead ball just to inform everyone. If it lodges in the top flap of the pad of the batter, good practice to call and signal dead ball. Uh, things like uh, when a boundary six or, uh, or four gets hit, uh, it's no need in those instances to call or signal uh, dead ball. Uh, the law tells us it automatically becomes dead, but you don't need to call it. Just those instances where players don't know the law, just to inform everyone, if it is the helmet behind the keeper, uh, as an example, another example, if it lodges in the top uh, flap of the batting pad, call and signal dead ball. So now we've covered automatically dead. There are also instances where it's important for the umpire to call and signal dead ball. Of either of the umpires can call it. And best practice here to call it loudly to inform everyone that the ball is now dead. And once the ball is dead, anything that happens after that is irrelevant. If the umpires wants to intervene in a case of unfair play, either of the umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. 
if there is a possibility of a serious injury to a player or an umpire, either umpire, to call and signal dead ball. The important word in point two is it needs to be a serious injury to either a player or, or an umpire. If it's just the ball hit the finger of the player or maybe the foot of, of one of the, 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 the fielders, uh, no need to call and signal dead ball. It needs to be a serious injury according to to the umpire, things like um, if uh, the ball goes against the head of, of the batter or of the ball of any other fielder, in my view, that is a serious injury. Call and signal dead ball to prevent anything to happen after that. Because once you've called and signaled dead ball, anything that happens after that is irrelevant. If either of the umpires decides to leave his or her normal position to go speak to uh, his or her colleague before leaving your position, call and signal dead ball. If one or both bails falls from the striker's wicket before the striker had an opportunity to play at the ball, call and signal dead ball. The important Word in this sentence is, if it falls from the striker's wicket. If that is the case, if one or both bells, call and signal dead ball. So what happens if it falls from the, the bowler's in uh, side? No need to call and signal dead ball. If the players are happy to, the, the bail falls off, players are happy to continue playing, you will let play continue. Uh, but if you see it fall from the striker's wicket before the striker player had opportunity to play at the ball, call and signal dead ball. So if a striker is not ready for the ball and the bowler then delivers the ball and also the striker makes no attempt to play at the ball, call and signal dead ball. So in your opinion, the striker is not ready. And if the ball is delivered, and the important thing is the striker needs to make no attempt to play at the ball. If that is the case, call and signal dead ball. I can still hear a bit of background noise. Can uh, those that are not muted, please mute their mics. Thank you so much. Another instance where you will call and signal dead ball if the striker is distracted by any noise movement or in any way while preparing for the delivery. An example, someone walks in front of the side screen. If the striker is distracted by that, call and signal dead ball. You will also call and signal dead ball if there is an instance of a deliberate attempt to distract uh, the striker or a deliberate uh, distraction, deception, or obstruction of the batter. Uh, these are covered under Law 41. In those instances, you will also call and signal dead ball. So while the bowler is running in and the, the ball accidentally, the bowler accidentally drops the ball, call and signal dead ball. The bowler, while running in to deliver the ball, and before getting into his or her delivery stride, actually throw the ball towards the striker's end. Maybe to run out the striker. The law tells us, if that is the case, call and signal dead ball. So if the bowler, before entering the delivery stride, throws at the striker's uh, uh, wickets, call and signal dead ball. The important thing here is it needs to be at the striker's wicket. If the bowler is trying to run out, run, run out the non-striker, that is uh, something different, which we will cover later on. But the, this law refers to if the bowler throws at the striker's wicket, call and signal dead ball. If the ball does not leave the bowler's hand for any reason, call and signal dead ball. So whatever reason the ball, the bowler, if up uh, holds on to the ball, you need to call and signal dead ball. Also call and signal dead ball if while the ball is in play, that ball cannot be recovered. 
an example of this is inside the field of play. Let's say there's a there's a, a snake hole and the ball rolls down this uh, um, snake hole. That is an example of the ball while in play going down this this hole and the ball cannot be recovered. Call and signal dead ball. You will also call and signal dead ball if a person, animal or object comes within the field of play and touches the ball. And because of this, either of the side will be disadvantaged. Call and signal dead ball. You will also call and signal dead ball if the striker attempts to play at the ball and the striker does not have any part of the striker's person within the pitch. If the striker leaves uh, the pitch to go play at the ball, you will call and signal dead ball. Also, call and signal dead ball if you require to do so if under any of the laws not included. Next law that we're covering is the no ball law. Firstly, mode of delivery. I'm going to start with the with the picture on the left hand side. So if you can visualize this and looking where the arrow is going, the point of the arrow is where the striker is standing. And on, on the first picture on the left hand side, this is a right handed bowler. And if the right handed uh, bowler is bowling from the right hand side of the stumps, that is around the wicket. Uh, for me, how I remember whether the bowler is bowling over or around the wicket. Uh, if the bowling hand is away from the stumps or further from the stumps, that is round the wicket. If the bowling hand is closer to the stumps, that is over the wicket. So if you can just uh, visualize this in the second picture on the right hand side, the right handed bowler, if you can visualize where the stumps are, the right hand bowler running in, if you can visualize his right hand is closer to the stumps, closer than his left hand. And because the right hand is closer to the stumps than his left hand, he is bowling over the wicket. If, he, if the bowler uh, so right hand is further from the stumps, so in the, in the first picture on the left hand side, if you can visualize it, the bowlers, uh, is, uh, the right hand bowler's left hand is actually closer to the stumps, which meaning his right hand is further away, that is around the wicket if it was a right handed bowler. Same principle applies to the left handed bowler. You look at the hand, if the left hand is closer to the stumps, then is the EOC is bowling over the wicket. If, if you look at the, the uh, picture on the further, furthest right, this is the left arm bowler. And you, if you visualize it, his left hand is closer to the stumps. So that's over the wicket. If you look at the other pick, so left-handed bowler, just visualize his left hand is actually further away from the stumps because his right hand is closer to the stumps. And because his left hand is further away from the stumps, he is, he or she is bowling around the wicket. That is just my method of, of remembering when a bowler is bowling around or over the wicket. So in terms of the mode of the, the delivery, important uh, aspect of when before the over starts, and especially if it's a new bowler, you need to ask the bowler whether the bowler is, go, is bowling right-handed or left-handed, and whether this bowler is bowling over or around the wicket. Once the bowler has given you that information, it's then important that you relay that information to the striker. So the bowler tells you, I'm right-handed, and I'm going to bowl over the wicket. You will inform the striker uh, better 
a right-handed bowler and he's bowling over the wicket. So what happens after the bowlers now informed you that he's right-handed and he's bowling over the wicket? And then suddenly that bowler decides to change his or her mode of delivery, meaning he, the bowler informed you that he or she is bowling right-handed over the wicket. Suddenly, without informing anyone, the bowler decides to bowl around the wicket. So if the bowler changes mode of delivery, the law tells us that the umpire needs to call and signal no ball. The bowler is allowed to change his or her mode of delivery, but before doing that, he or she needs to inform the umpire. And if he or she informs the umpire, the umpire then needs to inform the striker. And if that is the case, no problem. The bowler can then go around or over the wicket, whatever uh, the case may be. But if, the, uh, but if the bowler fails to notify the umpire of a change of mode, umpire needs to call and signal no ball. Underarm bowling is not allowed in cricket anymore, except by special agreement before the match. This is now law. Many years ago, uh, the, um, this was not part of the law. And, um, and one of the international side exploited this. It was last ball of the of the, um, a 50 over match. Batting side needed six to win. The bowler actually bowled the underarm ball and rolled it towards the striker. Obviously, the striker couldn't hit it for six uh, because the ball was rolling along the, the ground. At the time, it was still within the laws. After that incident, the lawmakers uh, brought the change to the law and they've now outlawed it. No underarm bowling allowed anymore except by special agreement before the game. So the law guides us for delivery to be fair in respect of the arm, the ball should not be thrown. So what happens if a bowler throws the ball or a bowler delivers the ball under arm? What should we as umpires do? Law tells us that if the bowler either throws the ball or decides to deliver the ball under arm, umpire needs to call and signal no ball. And once the ball is dead, the umpire needs to inform his or her colleague why the call of no ball. The bowler is in umpire shall then warn the bowler and indicate this is your first and final warning for whether it was throwing or delivering underarm. And you, you will then inform everyone of this fact that there's been a first and final warning for the bowler for either throwing or bowling in underarm delivery. Before I move on, okay. I, I, want to make, I want to make clear that this needs to be a blatant uh, throw. If it's a blatant throw, Yes, then you, uh, you call and signal uh, no ball. And this is, as per the laws of cricket, there are playing conditions that govern, that govern um, international and provincial and most of the other competitions that, uh, that they've added um, an additional portion uh, under this that, that allow for a flexing of 50 degree, 15 degrees. I'm not going to go into it, but... The point I'm just trying to make is, if it's a blatant throw or the ball is delivered underarm, you need to call and signal no ball and give the bowler first and final warning. So what happens in, in, if that same bowler, in the same innings, throws the ball or delivers it underarm again? What do you do? Now you, you'll direct the captain of the fielding side. I've given the bowler first and final warning already in this innings. Now you need to suspend the bowler from bowling. If the over needs to be completed, another bowler needs to do it. And that bowler may 
not bowl uh, the the following over. So if the bowler is completing the over, that bowler uh, shall not be allowed to bowl the next over. And that bowler that was suspended shall not bowl again in that particular innings. And you, you will inform everyone and you will report this to the governing body. We cover, we've covered this under the dead ball law. What happens if a bowler throws the ball towards the striker's end before entering his or her delivery stride? The law tells us the umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. This is at the ball, uh, uh, ball thrown by the bowler before entering his or her delivery stride towards the striker's end. If that is the case, call and signal dead ball. Fair delivery, the feet. What does the law say about the feet? Let's have a look. So for a delivery to be fair in respect of the feet. So when we speak about the feet, we will firstly look at the back foot and what the law say about the back foot. And then we'll look at uh, what the law say about the front foot. Let's start with the back foot. The law tells us that, and importantly, the, the, the crease that goes with the back foot and if, is the return crease. The crease that goes with the front foot is the popping crease. Let's start with the back foot. The law tells us that the bowler's back foot must land within and must not touch the return crease. So back foot, return crease. Must land within and should not be touching the return crease. What about the front foot? So the, the crease associated with the front foot is the popping crease. So back foot, return crease, the, the front foot is the popping crease. So the law guides us by telling us that the bowler's front foot must land with some part of the foot, whether grounded or raised, behind the popping crease. I'm going to get back to bullet point number one. There is a picture that illustrates bullet point number one clearly, and I'll get back to it. Uh, bullet point number two, so when it comes to the front foot, the law tells us the front foot must land with some part of the foot, whether it's grounded or raised, needs to be behind the popping crease. So these are the criteria that you need to take into account. So bullet point number one uh, speaks about the bowler's front foot must land with some part of the foot with a grounded or raised on the same side of the imaginary line joining the two middle stumps. There's a, um, I'm going to show you a picture uh, later on that will illustrate bullet point number two clearly. Let's look at a few uh, pics that will clearly show us how to apply the back foot and the front foot nobles. So let's start with the front foot in this picture. What questions do you ask when it comes to the front foot? And which crease is associated with the front foot? the popping crease is associated with the front foot. So the front foot, is there any part of the front foot whether grounded or raised behind the popping crease? If your answer to that question is yes, then we're happy with the front foot. So looking at this pick, this is a right-handed uh, right bowler bowling over the wicket. There is a huge part of the front foot behind the popping crease. We're happy with the front foot. Which crease is associated with the back foot? The return crease. What question do you need to ask yourself when it comes to the back foot? Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? In this uh, pick, yes, the back foot is touching the return crease. And because the back foot is touching the return crease, this is a no ball. The front foot. What question do we ask yourself? Is there any part of the front foot with the grounded or raised behind the popping crease? The answer to that question is yes. Back foot. Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, there's not. So this is a fair delivery.
let's start with the back foot here. Is the any part? This is a left arm bowler, uh, left arm spin bowler bowling around the wicket. So start with the back foot. Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, there's not. So we're happy with the back foot. Front foot. Is there any part of the front foot with the grounded or raised behind the popping crease? Yes, there's a big portion of the front foot behind the popping crease. So this is a so we're also happy with the front foot. So this is a fair delivery. Again, you might ask the question, yeah, but the front foot is over the return crease. When it comes to the front foot, there's only one crease that you need to look at, and that is the popping crease. And the only question that you need to ask yourself about the front foot, not whether is it over the return crease or is it touching the return crease, the front foot and the popping crease, they go together. So you need to ask yourself, looking at the front foot, is there any part of the front foot grounded or raised behind the popping crease? Yes. When it comes to the back foot, now you look at the return crease. And there's nothing touching the return crease, so this is a fair delivery. Let's start with the front foot. Is there any part of the front foot with the ground to raise behind the popping crease? Yes, we're happy with the front foot. Back foot. Any part of the back foot touching the return crease? Yes, it is touching the return crease, so this is a noble. Back foot. Any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No. Front foot. Is there any part of the front foot whether grounded or raised behind the popping crease? Looking at the speak, you can see there is a small portion of the line of, of the heel behind the popping crease. So this is a fair delivery. And when you're looking at the the the, the popping crease, which edge do you need to look at? You need to look at the back edge when calling. Uh, making the call. Do not look at the front edge, look at the back edge. So is there any part of the front foot with the ground to raised behind the back edge of the popping crease? In this case, yes. So it's a fair delivery. Back foot, touching the return crease? No. Front foot, is there any part of the front foot with the ground to raised behind the popping crease? And again, I said, you need to look at the back edge, not the front edge. So there's nothing of the foot of the front foot behind the back edge of the popping crease. So this is a no ball. Back foot, is it touching the return crease? No, it's not. So happy with the back foot. Front foot, is it touching the, uh, is there any part of the front foot with the ground to raised behind the popping crease? No, there's not. And because of that, this is a noble. Important fact that I want you to remember, you need to take into account the landing of the, of the first landing of the front foot. That is important. Do not look at where the front foot ends up when judging the front foot noble or even the back foot noble. You need to judge where it, the first landing. If the first landing and there was a part of the of the foot behind the package of the popping crease, and after that it slid over and ends up as in this picture, that would be a fair delivery because you do not judge it where it ends up. You judge it, you judge it when that first when the front foot lands for the first time. So that's important, not where it ends up. Judge that first landing, and upon that first landing, if there was a portion of the foot behind the the uh, backage of the popping crease, it would then be a fair delivery. But in this case, let's say that is first landing, so it's nothing behind the the backage of the popping crease. In snowball, let's look at the back foot first. Not not touching the return crease. We are happy with the back foot. Front foot, what question do you ask yourself? Is there any part of the front foot whether grounded or raised behind the popping crease? And you can see at this peak, in this peak, there's a small portion of the heel behind the back edge of the popping crease. So we're happy that this is a fair delivery.
back foot, not us in the recurrent degrees, were you happy? Front foot, what question do you ask yourself? See any part of the front foot where the ground is raised behind the packets of the popping crease. In this pick, there's no part of the heel behind the packets of the popping crease. Hence, this is a no ball. Remember earlier, I spoke, I spoke about uh, when it comes to the front foot, the front foot should also not be, if, uh, if you can visualize this, this is a left arm um, spin bowler bowling over the wicket. So just visualize this. And uh, upon, as the front foot is landing, look where the front foot is landing. So if you can draw yourself an imaginary line from middle stump to middle stump, if that front foot of this left arm over the wicket bowler is landing on the other side of that imaginary line from middle stump to middle stump, then this is also a no ball. And the reason for this is the lawmakers are saying that bowler is now actually changing his or her mode of delivery. So because that bowler is so far uh, uh, on the other side, this bowler is actually bowling around the wicket. In my 15 years of umpiring, I, I never had this, but it is part of the law, so uh, it, uh, um, it, it must have happened uh, lots of times in other countries. So what happens if the bowler while delivering the ball, breaks the wicket. The law tells us that if, while the ball is in play and as the bowler is running up and delivering the ball, the bowler breaks the wicket with any part of his or her body, what should you do? The, um, the law tells us, call and signal no ball. So, bowler breaks the wicket with any part of his or her body, and the law actually includes any clothing or object that might fall from the bowler while delivering the ball. Some bowlers do play with um, with um, towels uh, um, in their pants. If that towel should, um, while the bowler is delivering the ball, should fall onto the onto the wicket at the bowler's end and dislodging uh, one of the bells or both bells either umpire to call and signal no ball. So what happens if the ball bounces more than once or the ball rolls along the ground? Law tell us that the umpires are call and signal no ball. If the ball that was delivered and did not touch the bat or person of the striker, if this ball bounces more than once. Important word here is more than once. So if the ball bounces more than once, or the ball rolls along the ground before reaching the popping crease, the umpire to call and signal no ball. So it needs to bounce more than once before reaching the popping crease, or it needs to start rolling along the ground before reaching the popping crease. If that is the case, umpire to call and signal no ball. Also, if the bowler a bowl, a delivers a ball and this ball pitches wholly or even partially off the pitch before reaching the line of the striker's wicket or before uh, reaching the bowling uh, crease, umpire to call and signal no ball. So it needs to either pitch uh, uh, only off the pitch or even partially off the pitch. If it uh, before reaching the striker's wicket, umpire to call and signal no ball. So what happened? The ball gets delivered and this ball now comes to rest in front of the striker's wicket. It actually stops in front of the striker's wicket. The law tells us if a ball that was delivered comes to rest or stops in front of the striker's uh, wicket, 
before the stri- before having previously touched the bat or person of the striker, the umpire to call and signal no ball, and immediately call and signal dead ball. So these two things needs to happen within a split second of each other. So if you do see the ball being delivered, starts rolling towards the 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 striker, and then comes to a stop before uh, reaching the line of the striker's wicket. Umpire needs to call and signal no ball, and a split second later, call and signal dead ball. So it's like it, it goes together. You need to to score no ball, dead ball. It needs to be within split second of each other. Also, you will call and signal dead ball if the ball goes off the pitch and the striker actually needs to leave the pitch to go play at the ball. You will also call and signal dead ball and no ball. What happens if a fielder intercepts a delivery? So a ball, a ball that gets de- delivered. Uh, I can hear some background noise. Can you please mute your mics? Thank you so much. If a ball that was delivered makes contact with any part of the fielder's person before it either makes contact with the striker's bat or person or before passing the striker's wicket, the umpire shall call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball. Again, the, they, these two calls need to be close to each other. You call and signal no ball, and a split second later, you need to call and signal dead ball. Just an example of this, let's say spinners bowling, and the, the, the short leg is standing so close so, so close to the wicket, uh, the, the, the spin bowler then bowls the ball, and the ball actually hits the foot of the short silly point um, fielder. That's it's just an example of this. So as soon as that ball hits the foot of the silly point fielder, call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball. So what happens if a ball bounces over head height of the striker? So a bowler delivers a short pitch delivery and that ball passes over head height of the striker standing upright at the popping crease. According to the laws of cricket, the umpire should call and signal no ball. Again, this is the laws of cricket. I, they, in most of the competitions around the world, they do have a playing condition in place that treats this particular delivery differently. Uh, if you, see, you probably saw on TV, if a bowler bowls a short pitch ball and it goes over the head height of the striker standing upright at a popping crease, what do the umpires call? Yes, they actually call wide. But that is a playing condition that was incorporated in into the various competitions uh, around the world. And as soon as there is a playing condition, a playing condition overrides the law. But according to the laws of cricket, if a ball goes over the head height of the striker standing upright at the popping crease, I'm passed to call and signal no ball. There are other types of no balls as well. Uh, position of the wicketkeeper, limitation of onside fielders, fielders getting on the pitch, bowling of dangerous and unfair short pitch uh, balls, bowling of dangerous and unfair um, non-pitching deliveries, bowling of a deliberate front foot no ball, these are also other examples of no-ball infringements as per the laws of cricket. I do have a few picks that will illustrate this clearly. So this is an example. The wicketkeeper is going for stumping, but the law tell us, uh, tells us that the wicketkeeper needs to wait until the ball is past the stumps before invoking or trying to take off the bells. If the keeper takes the ball, like in this pick, in front of the stumps, the strikers in umpire needs to call and signal no ball. According to the laws of cricket, there is a leg side restriction. If you can uh, visualize this, this is a right hand uh, uh, batter, and you are allowed a maximum of two fielders 
behind the popping crease on the leg side. Max two fielders behind the popping crease on the leg side. Here's an example. The, uh, the previous slide said, how many are you allowed um, behind the popping crease on the leg side? You only allowed a max of two. In this picture, you will see there are three fielders on the onside behind the popping crease. And in this instance, once the ball gets delivered, the strikers in umpire you know, needs to call and signal no ball. Uh, this is a bit, uh, a bit of a uh, field technique. If you do have lots of fielders around the bat, like in this case, you see there's a, there's a uh, um, leg gully and there's a short leg fielder. And if that fielder is blocking your view of the, the popping crease or, and of the batter and of the stumps, best practice is in this instance rather to, to go stand on the other side. You will have a much clearer picture with no one blocking your view. That's just a bit of field graph. When it comes to fielders encroaching on the pitch, fielder is not allowed to stand on the pitch. If the uh, fielder's got any part of, the, of his uh, person uh, on the pitch or uh, over the pitch, fielders, this is not allowed. Policy number needs to call and signal no ball. Revoking a call of noble. Umpire shall revoke the call of noble if dead ball is called, example, bowler overstepping but not delivering the ball. So let's say the bowler uh, gets back foot lands, front foot lands, you see the front foot is. Um, there's no part of the front foot behind the, the popping crease. You call no ball, and as you call no ball, the bowler goes through his or her action, but actually does not deliver the ball. In that instance, we've just heard under the dead ball law, if that happens, you actually need to call and signal dead ball. But remember, you already called uh, and signaled no ball because you, you saw the, the, the foot um, landing um, over the popping crease you need to revoke that call of no ball. If there's a no ball and a wide in the same delivery, law tell us that no ball is boss. No ball will override the wide call. So you, so you won't, if there's a no ball and a wide in the same delivery, you won't give two penalty extras. You won't say one for the no ball, one for the wide. You will only take the one and the noble will override the wide. Once you've called noble, law tell us that the ball does not become dead on the call of noble. What is the penalty for noble? There's a one run penalty for the noble. Noble do not count as one for the over. How can you be dismissed of a noble? There are three ways that you can be dismissed of a noble. Firstly, hit the ball twice, obstructing the field, and run out. These are the only three modes of dismissals that is allowed from a noble. Penultimate law for me for the evening. The white ball. Judging a white. Before I, uh, I go into how do you judge a white, what I want to make clear is the what I'm going to cover now is what the law say or what more day cricket say how you judge a white. You should not confuse yourself what you see in limited over cricket, white ball cricket, whether it's T20 or 50 over cricket. They have playing conditions in place that uh, that guides um, the, the, the wide uh, ball uh, law. And you'll actually see white ball lines or lines uh, marked on the on the. Um, 
on the pitch, and those lines are there to assist the umpires in consistently calling calling wide. Do not confuse yourself with those with those lines. What we're discussing tonight is how to judge a wide in more day cricket. So, Lord, tell us how do you judge it? Judge it. The, the ball, if passing wide of where the striker is standing or has stood at any point after the ball came into play for that delivery and which also would have passed wide of the striker standing in a normal batting position. So all the laws say, you judge a wide if it passes wide of the striker standing in his normal batting position. That is, that is what the law tells us how to judge a wide. But you might ask yourself, passing wide, the, law tell, the point number one say passes wide of the striker standing in a normal uh, batting position. But what is passing wide? What is the interpretation of passing wide? The law guides us here as well. The law tells us that you need to interpret passing wide of the striker. And how do you interpret uh, it? It, need, it, the ball needs to be sufficiently within reach of the striker so that the striker is able to hit the ball by the means of a normal cricket shot. So that is the interpretation as per the law of passing wide of the striker. So if, in your opinion, the striker is able to play at the ball by the means of a normal cricket shot, uh, fair delivery. You should not be calling that wide. But if the ball passes wide of the striker and that striker is not able to hit the ball by the means of a normal cricket shot, according to the laws of cricket, that ball should be called and signal wide. The umpire, if the umpire judges the delivery to be wide, the umpire then needs to call and signal wide when the ball passes the striker's wicket. And then again to signal wide to the scorers once the ball is dead. So importantly, wait till the ball passes the striker's wicket. Don't be in a, in a hurry to call and signal wide. Wait till it passes the striker's wicket. And once it's passed the striker's wicket, now you call and signal wide. Revoking the call of wide. If you do or if you did call wide a bit too early and you then and then there was contact between the ball and the striker's bat or person, you need to revoke your wide call. That's why it's important. Do not call wide too quickly. Wait until it passes the striker uh, striker's wicket, then call and signal wide. Point number two. We, are, we heard earlier under the no-ball law, no-ball is the boss. So if there is a wide and a no-ball of the same delivery, no-ball will count for that delivery. Also, the law tells us that if a striker, by moving, and because the striker is now moving, the striker now brings him or herself within sufficient reach, to be able to hit the ball by the means of a normal cricket shot, you shall not call that delivery wide. So striker moving and by him or her moving brings the ball within reach to, hit, to be able to hit it by the means of a normal cricket shot. You should not be calling that wide. The ball does not become dead on the call of wide. What is the penalty for wide? Yes, there is a one-run penalty for whites. So how will the run scored? All runs completed by the batters or a boundary allowance together with the penalty for the white shall be scored as white extras. So if a white gets bowled, the ball goes past the keeper and it goes over the boundary, it will be five runs in total, one for the white, four for the ball going over the boundaries, five in total. Why shall not count as one for the over? 
How can you be dismissed of a white? Four ways. Firstly, it wicked. Secondly, obstructing the field. A run out. And lastly, you can be stumped off a while. These are the only dismissed uh, methods how you can be dismissed off a while. You can see it's highlighted in green. So there is an exam, exam question on how you can be dismissed off a while. Last law for the evening for me before I hand over to Tom. Buy and leg buys. So what is the difference between a buy and a leg buy? Let's first start with what are buys? So the important thing that you need to remember when it comes to buys is the ball went past the batter and it did not touch any part of the batter's person or bat. That is the criteria that you take into account when judging a buy. It, the ball did not touch any part of the batter's person or the bat. That's all you take into account. You do not take, you will see later on, uh, we, you need to take into account whether a shot is played or not. When it comes to leg buys, that criteria, criteria is not in place when it comes to buy, so it's irrelevant whether you play a shot or not. The only question that you need to ask yourself when it comes to buys and whether you'll allow a buy. Did the ball touch the striker's person or the bat? If the answer to that question is no, you will allow a, a buy. If the, strike, if the answer to that question is yes, uh, and if it let's say strike the person or the or the bat, we will uh, in the next slide we will see how to handle it. If it if it struck the bat, obviously it will be runs. But the point I'm trying to make is, when judging a buy, the only criteria you need to take uh, into account, only question that you need to ask yourself: Did the ball touch the striker's person or bat? Nothing else you need to take into account. If the answer to that question is no. It did not touch anything. You will that will be seen as buys. Leg buys. So here the law uh, tell us that. So if the ball gets delivered and it strikes the person or the protective equipment of the striker. Leg buys can only be scored if the following two criteria has been met. So the first condition that you need to take into account when it comes to leg buys is, did, it, it, did the ball strike the person or the protective equipment of the striker? So that's the first condition. So if your answer to that question is yes, then there's two criteria that needs to be in place before allowing leg buys. What is the first of that criteria? The striker needed to attempt to play the ball with his or her bat. That needs to be in place. If there was an attempt to play the ball with his or her bat, then leg buys can be ordered. The other condition, if the striker tried to avoid being hit by the ball. Either of these two conditions needs to be in place for leg buys to be awarded. So the first thing, the ball needs to strike either the, pers the, the person or the protective equipment of the striker. And then one of these two conditions needs to be in place. The, tempter, the striker attempted to play the ball with his or her bat, or the striker tried to avoid being hit by the ball. If these conditions are in place, you will allow the leg buys. And if there was a noble from that particular delivery, the noble uh, shall count in addition to the leg buys. So the important thing when it comes to leg buys, after the ball has hit the person or the protective equipment of the striker, you need to ask yourself uh, before allowing leg buys, did the striker attempt to play at the ball or 
did the striker try to avoid being hit by the ball? If either of these conditions are in place, you'll allow the, the leg bias. When will you not allow the leg bias? Correct, just the opposite of this. Remember, we said the two conditions that needs to be in place, either the striker needs to attempt to play the ball uh, with the bat or trying to uh, avoid being hit by the ball. So, if neither of these two conditions are in place, leg bias shall not be awarded. So, how do you handle this if the, if, if the striker, let's say for argument's sake, sold his arms, didn't try to hit the ball uh, with the bat and the ball strikes the pads and the ball then ricochets towards the, the third man um, uh, boundary? As an umpire, you do handle this as follows. So, you need to call and signal dead ball if the ball goes from the pads over the boundary if the bear striker didn't um, offer a shot or let's say they do decide to take a uh, take a run so if you can visualize this the bowler delivers the ball striker does not offer a shot the, the the ball goes against the pad ricochets towards the the fine leg boundary and the striker the batter starts to run you need to wait until the batters has completed their first run. Once they've completed the first run, then you call and signal dead ball. Do not call and signal dead ball before they have not completed the first run or the ball didn't go over the boundary. The reason for waiting until they've completed the first run is you need to give the fielding side the opportunity to run out either of the batters. But as soon as they've completed one run, either umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. So if they, let's say for argument's sake, they decided uh, to take the single and they've now completed the signal, we've just heard now that you need to call and signal dead ball, you also then need to disallow all runs to the batting side. That run should not be allowed. Striker did not offer a shot, that leg by should not be allowed. Also, you will return any not out batter to his original end. So the striker that's now ended up at the bowler's end, you need to send the striker back to his or her original end. If there was a no ball, you signal it to the scorers. And if there were any other, uh, any, uh, or any far penalty runs that is applicable, except if the ball would have hit the protective helmet. Thank you, Tom. That is my laws that I'm covering for this evening. I'm now handing over to uh, to you to, law, to do laws 24 and 25. Thank you very much, Abdullah. Good evening to the listeners. I shall be taking you through laws 24 and 25 this evening. Law 24 is fielder's absence and substitutes. Quite often you see during a game of cricket, fielders going off the field due to injury or illness. What does the law prescribe for us to do? And what does the law prescribe for the fielders returning to the field that they need to do? When shall a umpire allow a substitute fielder? Let's see what the law says. The law says that if a fielder or if an umpire is satisfied that a fielder has been injured or become ill and that this occurred during the match or for any other wholly acceptable reason, they will allow a substitute. In all other circumstances, a substitute is not allowed. And the question was asked on Monday whether a substitute is allowed for a comfort break, which is to go to the toilet. And there the law is quite clear in saying that 
specifically for comfort breaks, substitutes are not allowed. So if a player comes up to you and says they need to go and use the toilet, you will allow them to go off the field, but you will not allow a substitute to come onto the field to field in their place. As Abdullah mentioned on Monday, quite often what the players do is they tell you that they're going off for strapping. And if they tell you that they're going off for strapping, then you will allow a substitute. Quite importantly, a substitute is not a replacement player. That substitute is not allowed to bowl, nor is he or she allowed to act as captain but they may act as a wicketkeeper with the consent of the umpires. What do we as umpires need to do when a player goes off the field or does not come back onto the field after an interval? The law says that if a fielder fails to take the field at the start of the match or at any later time, or leaves the field during play, the umpire or any umpire shall be informed of the reason for this absence. The player shall not thereafter come onto the field of play during a session without the consent of either umpire. Either umpire shall give such consent as soon as practical. For those of you who are joining us for the first time this evening, I just want to reiterate that any text that is shown in green is content that is examined in the level one Cricket South Africa umpires exam. So please take special note of text that is highlighted in green. So this next paragraph is going to be examined. It talks about penalty time. It says that the player will not be permitted to bowl until having been back on the field of play for the same amount of time that he or she was off the field up to a maximum of 90 minutes. So let's use a simple example. And I'm going to use test match times. 10 a.m. start until 12 midday is your morning session and you have a drinks break at 11 a.m. for four minutes before lunch at 12 o'clock. 12 to 12.40 is your lunch break. Second session is 12.40 until 14.40. Then you have a 20 minute tea break from 14.40 to 1500. Then you have your evening session from 1500 to 1700. So let us put a simple scenario together of a bowler who bowls the first over of the morning at 10 a.m. And in his third over of the morning at 10.20, the bowler pulls his hamstring. Let's call him a South African bowler, Anrich Nokia. And at 2020, Anrich Nokia goes off the field for a tight hamstring and he gets treatment and then comes back onto the field with our permission at 10.35. So how long has he been off the field for? He's been off the field for 15 minutes. The law is telling us here that he will have to serve 15 minutes of penalty time before he can bowl again. So from 10.35, when he comes back onto the field, he will have to wait 15 minutes. That is until 10.50, and he can bowl again at 10.50 when he has served his 15 minutes of penalty time. As the law says, the maximum amount of penalty time that any 
fielder has to serve is 90 minutes. If the player leaves the field before having served all of his or her penalty time, the balance is carried forward as unserved penalty time. So let's go back to that same example. Anrich Nokia went off the field at 10.20 and then he came back onto the field at 10.35. He was off the field for 15 minutes and so he needs to serve 15 minutes of penalty time before he can bowl again. Let's say at 10.45, Anrich Nokia has been back on the field for 10 minutes. He goes off the field again for further treatment on his tight hamstring. So he has only served 10 minutes. He still owes us five minutes. And let's say he is off the field again for another five minutes from 10.45 until 10.50. When he comes back on, at 10.50, how much penalty time does he owe us? He owes us 10 minutes of penalty time. Five minutes, which was carried over from his first period of time off the field, plus the five minutes that he has been off the field now from 10.45 till 10.50. On any occasion of absence, the amount of playing time for which the player is off the field shall be added to any penalty time that remains unserved, and that player shall not bowl until all of his or her penalty time has been served. So that's just completing the explanation of the example I've just given you of Anrich Nukia going off the field uh, twice, and the remaining penalty time from his first time off the field being added to the five minutes that he was off the field for the second time. Quite importantly, the period of time for a scheduled interval does not add to unserved penalty time, nor does it count as penalty time served. Let me give you a different example. Uh, to illustrate this point, you will remember from, I think, our second lecture that a drinks break is considered a scheduled interval. I mentioned in my times for a test match that the morning session is from 10 a.m. until 12 midday, and we have a drinks break from 11 a.m. to 11.04. So what happens if a player is off the field? Does the time that the player is off the field during a drinks break count against him? Law tells us in this point that no, it does not count against him. So. Let's use an example to illustrate this point. Let us use Kahiso Rabada, who is bowling for South Africa. 10 a.m. start. He goes off the field at 10.45 for a tight quadricep muscle. So he comes back onto the field after treatment at 11.15, okay? Now, in total, he's been off the field from 10.45 to 11.15, that is 30 minutes. However, as I've mentioned, in that time, there was a drinks break from 11 a.m. until 11.04. So law tells us that a scheduled interval will not count for or against a player. So he doesn't owe us 30 minutes of penalty time when he comes back onto the field. He owes us 30 minus four, which is 26 minutes of penalty time when he comes back onto the field at 11.15. So 11.15 plus 26 minutes that he owes us 
he can bowl again at 11.41. Okay, so quite importantly, scheduled interval, whether it's drinks, lunch, tea break, or change of innings, shall not count for or against a player penalty time. If there is an unscheduled break in play, the time shall also not count against a player who's off the field. Okay, so if, for example, Dachiso uh, Rabara goes off the field at 10.45 and then it starts to rain at 10.55, and it rains for half an hour until 11.25. He has been off the field for a total of 45 minutes. Apologies, 40 minutes. 10.45 until uh, 11. 25. However, the law says that an unscheduled break and rain is a common unscheduled break shall not count against a player if they are off the field because why? Everybody is off the field. It is not playing time. Okay. So even though he's been off the field for 40 minutes, uh, only that first 10 minutes when he was off the field from 10.45 until 10.55 when it started raining, that is going to be the penalty time he has to serve when he comes back onto the field with everybody else at 10.25. Okay, so unscheduled break, if a player is off the field, does not count against him because there is no play taking place. Then the law says that if there is an unscheduled break in play, the stoppage time shall count as penalty time served, provided that two things. One, the fielder who was on the field of play at the start of the break either takes the field on the resumption of play or his side is now batting. Or two, the fielder who was already off the field at the start of the unscheduled break notifies an umpire in person as soon as he or she is able to participate and takes the field on the resumption of play, or his side is now batting. The time before an umpire was notified shall not count towards unserved penalty time. So let's give some scenarios to explain these two points. Scenario one, the fielder who was on the field of play at the start of the break either takes the field on resumption of play or his or her side is now batting. So, uh, 10 a.m. start, Kajiso Rabada is bowling. And then at 10.30, he goes off the field. And then he comes back on at uh, 11.05. This is 65 minutes that he was off the field. But four of those minutes were drinks break from 1100 until 1101. So he owes us 61 minutes when he comes back onto the field at 1105. Now, he's been back on the field for 11 minutes at 1116, okay? And then it starts to rain at 11.16. And it rains for 30 minutes. 
and he comes back onto the field with his team at 11.46 when the rain stops. So what the law is saying in point number one is that from 11.05 when Kakiso Rabada came back onto the field until 11.16 when he was on the field, he served 11 minutes of penalty time. So he's reduced the penalty time owing from 61 minutes down to 50 minutes when it stops raining. Point number two on the screen tells us that because he was on the field when it started raining and because he returned to the field with his team when it stopped raining at 11.46, those 30 minutes of rain that are an unscheduled break, he can count those minutes as penalty time served because if it wasn't for the rain, he would have been on the field. So at 11.46, when he comes back onto the field, he owes us 50 minutes minus the 30 minutes of rain. He now owes us only 20 minutes. Okay, so you just need to think of it this way that if it didn't rain, he would have been on the field because he was on the field at the start of the rain interruption and he was on the field again after at the end of the rain interruption. So that is why he's allowed to count the unscheduled break as a penalty time served, that 30 minutes. Now let's give one more scenario for um, when a player now notifies an umpire in person during a rain break that they are now fit to play. So let's take a, another bowler. Let's take Jasprit Bumrah. Jasprit Bumrah is playing in a test match for India, a 10 a.m. start. He, he gets injured um, and goes off the field at 10.30. And while he is off the field at 10.50, it starts to rain. Okay, so he's been off the field for 20 minutes. So when it starts to rain at 10.50, he owes us 20 minutes. Okay. And let's say it rains for exactly an hour until 11.50. Okay. But what happens during that hour long drinks break, sorry, that hour long rain interruption, uh, Jasper Bumrah comes to the umpire's room at 11.20 and informs us, umpire Abdullah, I am now fit to play. And so what the law tells us is that from 11.20 until 11.50, when the rain stops we can count that 30 minutes as penalties time served by Jasper Bumba if he comes onto the field with his team at 11:50 when the um rain stops okay so remember we said he went he was on the field in the morning uh, got injured at uh, 10.30. So when it started raining at 10.50, he owed us 20 minutes of penalty time. From 10.50 until 11.20 when it was raining and he had not informed us of being fit again, that 
time does not count for or against him. Why? Because it's an unscheduled break. There was no play at that time. So he so he didn't add no time was added to his penalty time and no penalty time was served by him. Uh, but then at 11.20, after treatment from the physio, he came to us and he declared himself fit. So from 11.20 until 11.50, he served 30 minutes of penalty time. Uh, even though he wasn't on the field because he says he was fit and he did come back onto the field with his team at 11.50, um, it means that we can take that time as penalty time served by him. He only needed to serve 20 minutes of penalty time. Uh, he's served more than that. He's served 30. So when play resumes at 11.50, um, Jasper Boomer can bowl again because he has served his 20 minutes of penalty time that was owing when the rain interruption started. So it does all sound a little bit complicated. But what's important with these calculations for penalty time is to uh, write everything down step by step as each event happens, when the player goes off, when it starts to rain, when he informs you that he's fit, and when the players go back onto the field. And the critical part here is that he must go back onto the field along with the rest of his team. Um, if he doesn't go back onto the field along with the rest of his team after the rain interruption, then that time that he said he was fit while it was raining uh, will not actually be considered as penalty time served because he has not come back onto the field with the rest of his team. Um, not really required to go into that level of detail for the level one course, but I think it's uh, good for all of you to learn the principles from the start so you're able to implement penalty time calculations when required at a later stage in your umpiring career. Quite importantly, any unserved penalty time shall be carried forward into the next and subsequent days and innings of the match as applicable. OK, so uh, if a fielder is still owing penalty time uh, when that fielder's team now is going into bat, that penalty time carries over and that fielder will not be able to bat until the innings of his team batting has gone on for however much penalty time he is still owing or five wickets are down in his team's batting innings. Then only can he or she bat. Sometimes we a player shall not incur penalty time. When will this be? Let's see what the law says. A player's absence will not incur penalty time if he or she has suffered an external blow during the match and has left the field or is unable to take the field. So an external blow um, is a injury that the umpires need to see it needs to have taken place on the field and there needs to have been impact with either the ball or the ground or any part of the stadium uh, that the player might have um, knocked into uh, other players and umpires also an external blow uh, so examples of this are if a slip fielder uh, drops a catch and in the attempt of trying to catch the ball, the fielder splits his or her webbing 
and uh, blood starts flowing. So whenever you see blood, there is likely to have been an external blow. Um, if a uh, fielder's nose is bleeding, uh, then we need to find out how and why that fielder's nose is bleeding. If the ball um, hit the fielder's nose, then definitely that was an external blow. But if the fielder starts bleeding because the nose starts bleeding because of uh, heat exhaustion or heat stroke, unfortunately, that will not be classified as an external blow. So the fielder would have to serve penalty time. Uh, we saw it a few months ago when Andile Petlokwayo collided with uh, Keshav Maharaj in a, um, I think it was a T20 or a 50 over match against England. And uh, Petlokwayo went off the field. Uh, that was an external blow. Uh, if he had been fit enough to come back on, he would have been able to bowl immediately because the law tells us that if you have gone off the field for an external blow, doesn't matter how long you are off the field for, a player does not have to serve penalty time before he or she can bowl again once they're back on the field. Uh, however, for those of you who remember that game, Andile Petlukwaya actually suffered concussion and Dwayne Pretorius came on for him as a concussion replacement. Uh, so there was no penalty time uh, calculations required there. Um, other examples of external blows are if a fielder is running to take a catch and um, takes the catch, but unfortunately, runs into the advertising boards uh, just outside the boundary uh, that is still considered to be on the field of play. So uh, that will be an external blow and the fielder, if they go off the field for however long, um, when they come back onto the field, they will not have to serve penalty time. They will be allowed to bowl immediately. In the opinion of the umpires, the player has been absent for wholly acceptable reasons, which shall not include illness or internal injury. A wholly acceptable reason um, for a player not to have to serve penalty time. Um, in our leagues and uh, our provincial cricket in South Africa, we have a lot of students who play the game. If a student has to write an exam on a Saturday uh, morning, uh, say for example, his exam is at uh, 11 a.m. So he comes and plays for the first half an hour and then at 10.30 he leaves for his exam. He writes an exam for one hour and he's back at 12.30. He's been gone for two hours. Uh, for us, that is a wholly acceptable reason for a player to have left the field. So we will allow a substitute. And upon the return of that player, uh, we will not need him or her to serve penalty time because that is a wholly acceptable reason for that player not to be at the field. And so that player, on return may bowl immediately without having to serve any penalty time. Uh, just be careful what you allow as a wholly acceptable reason because you will be setting a precedence not just for that particular match but for the entire season. So it needs to be a really um, important reason. Uh, another one that has happened in the past is a doctor who was on call um, left his phone with the scorers and at uh, about an hour into the game he got a call had to go to the hospital and came back an hour and a half later that was a wholly acceptable reason and the doctor could bowl immediately upon his return 
did not have to serve penalty time. Okay, but these things uh, are useful to be discussed uh, at the toss uh, if there will be a wholly acceptable reason for a player to leave the field. Uh, it needs to be agreed with the uh, umpires uh, before the start of the game, if it is known. Let's talk about a player returning to the field without permission. What happens if and when that player comes into contact with the ball? Abdullah did allude to it earlier in the evening on the dead ball law. Let's expand on this particular incident. If a player comes into contact, apologies, if a player comes back onto the field of play without the umpire's permission and comes into contact with the ball while it is in play, the ball shall immediately become dead. Now, even though the the ball immediately becomes dead. It is good umpiring practice to call and signal dead ball in this particular incident because A, not every player knows this law and B, um, not every player will know that this fielder had not been given permission to come back onto the field. So to enlighten everybody on what has occurred, and the illegality of the player. Um, it is good umpiring practice. If a player returns to the field without permission and comes into contact with the ball, uh, then even though the ball automatically becomes dead, it is good umpiring practice for you to call and signal dead ball, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. Um, question here is, how will you uh, know whether or not the permission has been given? Um, because often players only speak to one umpire. It's good teamwork. Whenever you receive any news from any player to relay that message immediately to your colleague so that uh, you're both aware that a player has left the field and if he comes back onto the field without permission and you don't know whether your partner has given you permission or not, um, you sorry, if your partner has given you the message or not, uh, then you will know that the player hasn't been given permission to be back onto the field because your partner would have communicated it to you if um, he was given permission to come back onto the field. Uh, you don't have to always come together for that particular notification. You can just signal to each other that that player pointed that player, he's back and give a thumbs up to your partner. So what else will we do? We will award five penalty runs to the batting side. Also the runs completed by the batters along with the run in progress, if they had already crossed at the instant of the player coming into contact with the ball, uh, those runs will be scored. The ball shall not count as one of the overs, so it shall have to be re -bowled. And the umpires will inform everybody and after the day's play will report that player for that misdemeanor. Okay, so quite a um, a bit of punishment for players um, not asking permission before they return to the field and also coming into contact with the ball. Now, good umpiring practice as well is if you see a player has returned to the field without having notified you and getting permission from either umpire, then you must just go over to that player and say, player, I told you when you went off the field that you need to ask permission to come back onto the field. You are lucky that we've seen you. Otherwise, if we hadn't seen you and you had come into contact with the ball, 
X, Y, and Z would have happened. Okay, so I think once you let the players know the severity of the punishment that comes along with that law, then they will apologize and they will make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, don't be one of those uh, umpires who want to catch players out. Uh, if you see a player who's returned to the field without permission, go over to him or her and speak to the player and educate the player rather than trying to catch them out with five penalty runs when the ball comes to them and they come into contact with the ball. Okay, that's just uh, good match management. Last law for this evening, uh, batter's innings. And yes, I mentioned on Monday that some leagues, especially for um, older players, do still have runners. So let's see what the law has to say about batter's innings and runners. Who is eligible to bat and to act as a runner? Only a nominated player may bat or act as a runner. So if a player is not on the nomination list or the team sheet exchanged at the toss, that player will not be allowed to bat and will not be allowed to act as a runner. When does a batter's innings commence? The innings of the first two batters and that of any new batter on the resumption of play after the call of time shall commence at the call of play. At any other time, a batter's innings shall be considered to have commenced when the batter first steps onto the field of play. So when the first wicket falls in a test match, the number three batter, his or her innings shall commence when he or she crosses the boundary rope and comes on to the field of play. If a member of the batting side has unserved penalty time, which we've just spoken about in the previous law, that player shall not be permitted to bat or act as a runner until that penalty time has been served or that player may bat after his or her side has lost five wickets. So like I mentioned earlier, if a fielder is off the field and at the end of their fielding innings or bowling innings, that fielder owes one hour of penalty time, then the hour, the clock shall start and the penalty time shall begin to be served when the umpire plays calls play for that fielder's batting team's innings. And he or she will not be allowed to bat until an hour has elapsed or five wickets are down in his or her team's batting innings, whichever comes first. In the event of an unscheduled stoppage, the stoppage time after the batter notifies an umpire in person that he or she is able to participate shall count as penalty time served. Um, similar to the example I gave when a player is off the field and it starts raining, if that player comes to the umpire's room and informs them that they are now fit to uh, bowl uh, or to go back onto the field. In this case, they would inform the umpires that they are now fit to bat. Uh, then from the moment that the information is relayed to the umpires, and that information needs to be relayed by the player, not by the player's captain. It needs to, the message needs to come in person from the injured player to either umpire to say, Umpi, I am now fit to play. Then we can start counting from there as penalty time served.
Can a better retire? Yes, of course, a batter may retire at any time during his or her innings when the ball is dead. Umpires shall be informed of the reason for retiring. If a batter retires of illness or injury or any other unavoidable cause, the batter is entitled to resume his or her innings. If this does not happen, that batter is to be recorded as retired, not out. If, however, a batter retires for any reason other than above, the innings of that batter may be resumed only with the consent of the opposing captain. If his or her innings is not resumed, that batter will be recorded in the scorebook as retired out. Okay, so that's why in a scorecard, you sometimes see retired not out and you sometimes see retired out. Those are the different reasons for the different recordings of a retirement of a batter in an innings. Abdullah has just mentioned a new law that has come into place for calling and signaling dead ball. A striker has a right to play the ball or to make a legitimate second strike after it has been delivered. However, the striker may only attempt to play the ball if some of his or her bat or person, whether grounded or raised, remains within the pitch. Should no part of the striker's bat or person remain within the pitch, Whilst the striker is playing the ball, either umpire shall immediately call and signal dead ball. Okay, so just imagine in your head that the ball has bounced on the pitch, but is going quite wide. And the batter to be able to try and play a shot goes off the pitch, then or in entirely off the pitch, uh, then law tells us that um, even before we call and signal wide for the delivery, as soon as the batter is off the pitch, then we shall call and signal dead ball. Okay. That is all the laws that we are going to present for this evening. Uh, next week, Monday, we shall present law 26 to 31 and now I shall stop presenting and go to the chat box to go through the questions that we have uh, got to and I shall start at the top with Datrum. Datrum has faced a situation when he signaled leg by but the batter indicates that he has hit the ball with the bat. Should Datrum revoke the leg by signal after consultation with the strikers and umpire? Uh, Abdullah, not all batters are honest. What should Datrum do in this situation? Uh, thanks for your question, uh, Datrum. So when it comes to leg bias, and especially uh, if the batter, uh, if the batters are taking a, a single, so before signaling the leg bias, you need to wait until the ball is uh, is dead. But while while the batters are running, you usually glance over at uh, your colleague, let's say at strikers in, and your colleague, uh, you should be communicating with each other. Your colleague should then be able to give you his or her opinion whether he, he or she thinks it is a leg by or not. If your colleague indicates it is a leg by, you go with uh, you go with your colleague's uh, call. If your colleague tells you it's runs, you go with uh, with the runs. So now, so so now when it comes to batters datum. Uh, you can never uh, trust the players. They will play the situation. Uh, lots of, um, I would say, an eight out of ten or even nine out of ten players will play the situation. If 
if that was a, a, a ball popped into the air and a fielder caught it, uh, 99% of the players wouldn't put up their hand and walk and say, and say I, I've nicked it, the player caught it, I'm now walking. Um, so point I'm trying to make is do not trust the players. Stick to your original signal. If you decide it together with your colleague, as I said, you do have you do have time, especially if they run a single. You do have time to look at your colleague and um, to to get his or her opinion. And if the two of you decide it was a leg by, you stick with your leg by call. Do not start uh, um, going on uh, Peter's word. Once you're going to start uh, doing that, yes, they might be the one or two uh, really honest uh, uh, batters, but rather stick with your call to, that you made together with your your colleague. Do not start revoking uh, si sig signals. Um, yeah, so just to uh, summarize, wait until the ball is dead. Look at your colleague before making the signal. Don't be too quick to make the signal. Now your colleague tells you there's a bit of uh, bat in. Now you want to revoke uh, your signal. Now wait rather. Once you and your colleague decided on whether it's runs or leg buys, stick to it. Do not go on what batters say. Uh, if there was bat involved, ugh, just one of those those cases. There are times where you will you will signal runs where it actually came off the pad. Batters uh, and 100% of the time will take will take the runs. So yeah, do not change your signal or revoke your signal. Datrum. Over Tom. Thanks Tula. Another question from Datrum. How often do umpires change ends in international matches or any league matches? Uh, or is it left to them to decide? Um, I think you did go over this last mm -hmm. week, but if you can just repeat. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Tom, I will. Uh, term depends on the, f depending on the format that um, of the match. If it is a limited over match, whether it's a 50 over or a 20, 20 match, in limited over games, the umpires will not change ends. If it's more day cricket, where they are, um, and the game consists of uh, two innings, the umpires need to change ends once both sides has completed their first innings. So side A went into bat, completed their innings, Side B then goes into bat and they complete their innings. Once both first innings are completed, the umpires need to change ends before the start of Team A's second innings. Over, Tom. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Our next question is from Savatam. Is it necessary for the bowler to inform the umpire his bowling side every time he comes on to bowl? So that's right arm over the wicket or right arm around the wicket. Abdullah? Sarvatam, thanks for your question. Yes, it's an important duty of the umpire. As soon as a new bowler comes on to bowl, that bowler needs to inform you uh, whether he's right-handed or left-handed and whether he or she is coming over or around the wicket. Why is that important? Because that information you need to relay to the to the striker. So so yes, each time a new bowler comes on, he needs to inform you of uh, whether it's right hand or left hand, and then over or around the wicket. Over, Tom. Thanks, Tula. And I think it's a good idea as well if the bowler is coming back for a second spell. Uh, just to reconfirm with that bowler if they're still going to be right arm over the wicket. Next question is from Saga. It cannot be a no ball if bowler didn't inform at first ball it's umpire's responsibility to ask. Um, yeah, is it the umpire's responsibility to ask the bowler or is it the bowler's responsibility to inform the umpire? Dula? Saga, umpire's responsibility to ask the bowler. Law is quite clear on this. Umpire needs to ascertain whether the bowler is right or left-handed 
and whether he or she is bowling over or around the wicket. So umpire's responsibility to ask. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Another question from Datrum. Uh, can you share your experience on a bowler blocking your view during their follow through? How would you deal with such a situation? I've been facing this problem quite frequently and have to proactively change my position while the ball is in the air. What is the best solution? Please comment. Abdullah, you can give your comments first and then maybe I'll uh, add to them. I'll copy that, Tom. Taitra, uh, once again, thanks for your question. So, firstly, uh, never ever datum change your uh, position. Do not change body position. Do not change your head or move your head. You should be standing still when uh, making your uh, decisions. Only your eyes should be moving. Try to keep the head still at all times. If a bowler is blocking your way, you need to inform that bowler that you see is blocking your way and if there is going to be a albis out and your view is being blocked you will not be able to adjudicate on that lbw and that bowler should not hold you responsible that usually worked as soon as you tell the bowler you're blocking my way i'll not be able to adjudicate on an lbw uh, usually the bowler will make sure that they do not uh, block your way. Also, if a bowler is blocking your way, especially a fast bowler, if um, after the bowler delivers the ball and that bowler is blocking your way, for me, that's usually a sign that that bowler is actually running straight down the, the pitch. That mm. bowler is actually in the danger area. So that's another thing. You can go go check, but for me, that's a cue. If a fast bowler, or uh, usually the fast bowler, if they're blocking your view, they're usually in the danger area. And you can also then relay that message saying, firstly, spoke, speak to, uh, but to the bowler about uh, um, the LBW, and you will not be able to adjudicate. And then secondly, saying, because you're blocking me, you're in the danger area. You, you first give him, uh, let's say, a friendly warning, and if they persist, you can go over to uh, the formal warnings. Uh, Tom, those are my two inputs. Uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Abdullah. I've had an incident before in a club match, uh, spinner of St. Augustine's Cricket Club here in Cape Town. He was the captain as well, Evan Jacobs, a spin bowler, um, and he would land right in front of me. And because he's a spin bowler without much of a follow through, he wasn't in the protected area. But I kept telling him on numerous occasions that he was landing up in front of me. I could not see and I would not be able to adjudicate any decisions, whether it's caught behind or leg before wicket. Um, it would be very difficult for me to do so. Um, and of course, as fate would have it, there was a huge appeal for leg before wicket. And all I did was I pointed straight to him saying, I cannot see, so I cannot give it, not out. And um, ever since then, he has never landed in front of me again. So unfortunately, I had to get to that point. Uh, but if you do mention it to the players that you cannot give a decision out if a bowler is in front of you, then they usually try and move away. Um, that's how I handled my particular situation. Patron. Next question is from Norbert. In the event that a bowler is suspected of an illegal delivery, uh, throwing, who among the umpires is responsible for monitoring the bowler's arm and if spotted is this also considered throwing the ball to the striker's end wicket in an attempt to run out for example abdullah you want to take that one uh, yes tom 
Uh, no, but thanks for your question. The the law guides us here uh, that either umpire can call and signal no ball if, in the opinion, the bowler has uh, thrown the ball. Although the strikers in umpire is in a better position to be able to make that call. Why? The bowlers in umpire the bowler will be focusing on the popping crease to check the front foot, uh, whether the front foot or this part of the front foot behind uh, the popping crease. So the law tells us either umpire can call it, but the strikers in umpire is in a much better position to see whether the bowler has thrown the delivery. In terms of your question of throwing towards the strikers in, uh, uh, there is a uh, that particular law, Norbert, which we've covered uh, tonight, and which we said that if the bowler, as soon as the ball comes into play, and before entering his or her delivery stride, that bowler throws the ball towards the strikers uh, in, for whatever reason, let's say he's trying to run out the, the, the striker, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. So the important uh, word here is, as so soon as that ball comes into play, or as soon as the bowler gives his or her first step, and the and before the back foot lands, or before the bowler enters his or her delivery stride, in that, pe in, in, in that window period, the bowler throws towards the strikers in, either umpire to call and signal no ball. Uh, sorry, dead ball. The law also guides us here and tells us if the throw was before the bowler enters his or her delivery stride, you will call and signal either umpire to call and signal dead ball, but you shall not, uh, you shall not give the bowler a warning for throwing. And the reason for this, it happened before the bowler enters, entered his or her delivery stride. If, if the bowler throws the ball after entering, entering his or her delivery stride, that is when either umpire to call and signal no ball, although the, uh, the striker is in the best position to call it. Uh, um, and if it happens the first time in that innings, to give the bowler um, his or her first and final warning. Over, Tom. Perfect. Thanks, Dula, for that very thorough explanation. Uh, next question is from Satraguna. Quite an interesting one. Uh, I've never seen this before, um, and I'm not sure if the law uh, speaks about this scenario. If a striker takes stance behind the wicket before the ball comes into play, and then comes in front of the wicket and attempts to play the ball with the bat. Uh, should I call and signal dead ball or let play continue? You want to take that one, Abdullah? Okay, I'm trying to visualize this. So the bowler is on top. Uh, just help me if I'm visualizing this correctly, Tom. So the bowler is on top of a uh, user run up. So the ball is not live yet. Striker is actually let's say, taking guard or standing behind the stumps. Correct. So as the bowler is now taking his or her first few steps, running now um, to deliver the ball, the striker yeah. now starts moving to in front of uh, the stumps, ball gets delivered, and then plays the ball. Is, am I visualizing this correctly? I think so, yes. Now, there's... I don't think this will ever happen, but there's nothing that I know of in the law that stops the striker uh, from doing this. But if I was a bowler and if I see this, I would bowl a 150k Yorker because that striker in moving uh, uh, moving uh, around while I'm coming in to run uh, will be... Uh, um, um, uh, will be vulnerable to, I think, a, a quick yorker. But to answer to answer the question, if the striker feels like he, he wants to stand behind the stumps, well, um, before the bowler starts, uh, um, takes his or her first step and then move in front, I don't see any issue with it. Um, I, um, I don't know if you see any issue with this, Tom, but I 
don't think anywhere in the law does it say the striker cannot do it. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Abdullah. Uh, I don't think there is any way in the law uh, disallowing this action. I just think, however, that bowlers usually wait for batters to be ready in front of the stumps before they start running in. So you could just end up in a scenario where the bowler doesn't run in because the batter is standing behind the stumps. If, however, the batter signals to the bowler that they are ready and the bowler should start running in, then, well, let it happen, I suppose. And uh, shall be fun to watch as an umpire. Next question is from Competiti. Um, he believes there is a textual mistake in the slide for buys. It says that the ball, which is not a no ball or a wide, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he thinks it should only say a ball that is not a wide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that slide back up and um, just explain that a no ball can also, once it goes past the striker and past the wicket keeper and the batters run, those will be buys, okay? So you have your one run penalty for the no ball, but any of the runs that are ran from end to end by the batters will count as buys. So the text is correct. Um, and I think no ball is definitely still applicable in this case. Um, actually, with uh, with wides, there will be no buys. So um, the wides will actually, whatever you run that goes past the wicket keeper, will count as wides and not buys. I hope that clears that up for you, competitive. Uh, next question is from Satraguna. Quite a long one. I haven't read it yet. The batting side needs one run to win the match and already lost nine wickets. After the bowler enters his delivery stride, the umpire adjudges it as a wide and then in preparing to receive the delivery, the striker puts down his wicket by the towel falling from uh, the back of the back, the striker. Let me just read this again. The striker's wicket is put down by his towel and then the ball passes very wide of him. There's an appeal for hit wicket that is made by the fielding side. Uh, should I call wide or should I give him out hit wicket? What is the result of the match? I think we've had that question uh, before, Abdullah. You want to take us through it? Uh, yes, Tom. Uh, thank you. Who asked the question? Satruguna. Satruguna, thanks for your for your question. The uh, when it comes to adjudicating the wide uh, on the field, you need to. Uh, wait till the ball is past the striker before calling and signaling uh, wide. That's good umpiring technique uh, because it's nothing worse. You uh, too hasty to call and signal wide. You, you, uh, and it happened to me before. There was quickly in calling the wide and a spinner was bowling and it was wide and the batter uh, played a, a late uh, um, cut to, to, the so, uh, to the third man boundary. Better literally took it out of the gloves of, of the, the, the keeper. But I was so quick to call it, call it too quickly, and the better late cut it to third man. I then had to, re to revoke my call. The point I'm trying to make is wait till it passes the striker before calling and signaling wide. So that's, uh, that's how you practically handle it on the field of play. But the law of uh, cricket 
sees the white call differently or this is how you need to interpret uh, it according to the laws of cricket. The, the ball shall be white from the instant the bowler enters his or her delivery stride. Meaning, as soon as that back foot lands, according to the laws of cricket, that is when the, uh, the, the ball is actually wide, theoretically. Practically, you wait till it passes the striker. Theoretically, as per the laws of cricket, it's actually wide from the moment the back foot uh, lands. So in this case, because if you go theoretically according to the law, the ball is wide from the moment the back foot lands, then it is wide. The hit wicket happens afterwards, so, I, so the, the, the batting side uh, needed one run to win. The moment that back foot landed, the ball is uh, technically wide as per the laws, so the batting side then... Uh, they needed one run, so the wide is the one run that they needed. So as soon as the match is concluded, we handle it under dead ball. As soon as that match is concluded, and the match is concluded uh, when the back foot landed, because that is when the, um, the ball is uh, w uh, wide, meaning the one run on the batting side, they needed the one run, and they win the match by one wicket. Over, Tom. Perfect, Abdullah. Yeah, a little bit um, confusing if um, you it's new to you that the wide actually starts when the back foot lands. But as soon as you get that into your head, then you understand why the wide is before the hit wicket. So um, quite right. Uh, wide counts first before hit wicket, so the team wins by one wicket. Uh, Kartik has given us a penalty time uh, calculation. Uh, Rabada goes off the field at 10.15 and comes back on at uh, 10.55, so he's been off for 40 minutes. Uh, there is a rain interruption at 10.55 and it ends at 11.40. Uh, at 11.05, it won't be the South African captain who declares. Let's say it's the Australian captain who declares at 11.05. So when can Kakis or Rabada bat? So we said that he was off the field for 40 minutes and then uh, from 10.55 until 11.05, when there is a uh, rain interruption. Um, that time does not count for or against him because, um, sorry, he's back on the field at 10.55 and then immediately it starts raining. So because he was back on the field, uh, that time of an unscheduled break will count in his favor. Um, so from 10.55 until 11.05 when the declaration is made by Australia um, is 10 minutes penalty time served. So at 11.05 when there is a change of innings, um, he owes us 30 minutes. Now, a change of innings, as I mentioned, is a scheduled break. So that 10 minutes change of innings does not count for or against Kachiso Robada. OK, um, so now we're going to take from 11.05, sorry, 11.15, when the South African batting innings starts until or is supposed to start but it's still raining until 11 40 when there is no more rain that is 25 minutes it is an unscheduled break but because Nahisa Rabada was on the field just as it started to rain that unscheduled break of 25 minutes will count as penalty time served and so 
at 11.40 when the rain stops. He owes us 30 minus 25. He only owes us five minutes. So he cannot open the batting, but he can uh, come in at number three if um, the wicket falls after five minutes, or he can come in when five wickets are down, whichever comes first. You would think that five minutes would come first before five wickets. But with South Africa's batting nowadays, you never know. Next question is from Karthik again. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Tom and Abdullah. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Like uh, you guys said, drinks cannot, drinks is a scheduled interval and uh, cannot be uh, used when it comes to, I mean, cannot be count as penalty times out when it comes to fielder's absence. So here, like um, we have a couple of scheduled intervals. One is drinks, which is from 11 to 11.04. And another one is interval between innings. So both coming in a bigger interruption. So is it like, do we have to treat them under 11.3? I mean, the smaller intervals coming in bigger interruption. So shall we treat the entire duration of interruption from 10.55 to 11.40 as interruption, provided he is on the field of play at the start of the unscheduled break? And on resumption, his side becomes batting. So can we count the entire duration as penalty time served for him? Um, good question, Kaptik. Um, Abdullah, I would not count the drinks break because it does not happen because they are off the field for a rain interruption. Uh, remember that uh, drinks breaks can be moved in time um when you do have other um breaks uh, so for example if an innings ends at um 10:45 then the new innings will start at 10:55 you will not take drinks at 11 a.m. uh 5 minutes into the new innings um so that is why i am disregarding the drinks break uh, in this particular calculation, but I am um, regarding the uh, change of innings because uh, a captain has declared, so that is a scheduled interval that takes place. Um, Abdullah, am I correct in my um, calculations? Yes, Tom, you are correct. You will ignore the drinks break, uh, and, but take into account the 10 minute change of innings interval. Thank you very much. Dula Karthik, I hope that answers your question. Next question, also from Karthik. Medical surgery is something we knew, it's an emergency but exam dates were already known and is it really needed to be treated under wholly acceptable reasons to include under penalty time not incurred? Um, uh, yes, Karthik, uh, for me, it's a wholly acceptable reason. Um, if we did not uh, treat it as a wholly acceptable reason and the uh, player, um, needed to serve penalty time after his or her exam, then you'll probably find that less and less students would play cricket because they would know that they can't bat or bowl um, for 90 minutes when they go to write their exam. Uh, when they come back for their exam, they need to serve penalty time. Um, so for me, uh, to encourage uh, students to carry on to playing cricket, um, I definitely regard uh, an exam as a wholly acceptable reason and um, they can bat or bowl immediately upon their return. Abdullah uh, Norbert asks, what qualifies as a legitimate second strike? I think we will deal with that in more detail in lecture number six when we are 
looking at the modes of dismissals, one of which is hitting the ball twice. But if you can uh, just maybe uh, give Norbert a quick answer on that. Thanks for your question, uh, Norbert. Under the modes of dismissals, there is a one called hit the ball twice. You are not allowed to willfully hit the ball uh, a second time, except under one circumstances. There's one exception. You are allowed to legally hit the ball a second time only to protect your wickets. That is the only time that you legally allowed to hit the ball a second time, only to protect your wicket. Thanks, Tom. Perfect. Thanks, Tula. Uh, Satraguna asks, when a short run occurs at the striker's end, when should the striker's end umpire call and signal short run? Should he or she call during while the ball is in play or when the ball becomes dead? Uh, Satraguna, we did deal with this on Monday, but I will um, explain it again. You, as a striker's end umpire, or as a bowler's end umpire, if the short run happens at your end, you should call and signal loud enough for everybody on the field to hear short run as and when it happens. So while the ball is in play, um, that will probably also help for the batters not to run another short run in the same delivery. And that is why I can guarantee that none of you watching cricket in however many years you have been following the sport for, you will never have seen more than one short run on the same delivery. Why? Because the umpire who sees a short run signals, calls and signals short run immediately. And then the batters will be careful not to run short for the next turn that they are making. Um, when the ball is dead, it is the responsibility of the bowler's end umpire to make the final signal of short run to the scorers. So the first signal and call is during the play and is for the players to know that there was a short run. The signal after the ball is dead is by the bowler's end umpire, even if the short run occurred at the striker's end, it is the bowler's end umpire who makes the final signal of short run to the scorers. I hope that answers your question, Satraguna. Next question is from Adrian. What happens if the bowler is in front of you and the ball goes for a wide? What should you do? Abdullah? Adrian, yes, it happens uh, quite often that the bowler do block your, block your view in his or her uh, follow through. So I handle it unless I can clearly see that the ball uh, went wide. I will call and signal wide ball. If I did not see the ball, let's say it was a, a, a T20 game and there's usually the wide uh, um, uh, line markings to assist us in consistently calling wide. So if I did not see the ball going um, um, on the, let's say it's a right-hand batter on the left-hand side of the, of, the, of the wide marking, if I didn't see it and the ball is in my view, I, I don't call it. I need to clearly see uh, that the ball, that the ball um, is uh, wide for me to call it. If a bowler is blocking my view and I didn't see it, uh, I, I won't call it. I don't know about you, Tom. Uh, do you call it if you think it looks, even though the bowler is blocking your view? Do you go on a gut call and 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 it looked like it was wide, then call it, or do you also want to see it wide before calling it? Uh, good question, Abdullah, and good question from um, Satraguna, I think it was. Um, oh, sorry, Adrian. Um, it's a tricky one because the batters deserve a wide if the ball goes, you know, wide of the uh, guideline in a limited overs match. 
and in today's fast paced uh, cricket um, in limited overs matches, every ball matters, every run matters. Um, so it's important to get the wides uh, and the no balls, especially with the free hits that the no balls come with. It's important to get those uh, calls correct. Um, so what I actually do is if a bowler in their follow through is uh, obstructing my view of a wide, um, I'm going to do what Abdullah said you shouldn't do, <laughs> is I'm going to move my body to try and see uh, whether the ball goes um, wide of the wide guideline or inside the wide guideline. Um, I will only do that if I can see that the batter is not playing a stroke. So I'm not going to miss a court behind or a leg before wicket decision because the ball is far from the batter. Uh, all I'm trying to do by moving my head is to try and see around the bowler to see if uh, the ball is wide or not. So I know Abdullah said we shouldn't move our head at all when making decisions. Um, that for me is for making leg before wicket decisions and for making court behind decisions. Uh, but if those two decisions are out of play because the ball is wide of the striker, and I want to see if the ball is wide of the wide line or just inside the wide line, then I will try and look around the bowler to see uh, where the ball passes. Um, it's still not easy uh, because that needs to happen very quickly. Uh, but often you also get body language reaction from the bowler and the wicketkeeper and the batter as to whether that ball is wide of the wide line uh, guideline or not. So um, I would I would probably, if I don't see it myself, um, I would use a few clues to uh, to decide. Uh, but yeah, generally, like Abdullah says, you should not call a wide if you don't see the ball uh, properly. Um, hope that answers your question out there. Uh, last question in the chat box is from Kaptik. Uh, what if a substitute fielder comes into contact with the ball in play? Um, I think without permission. Um, I missed out. Uh, I missed out. He has okay. returned without permission. Yeah, re returning without permission. Okay. Um, after the batters have completed two runs and have crossed for the third run. How many runs shall be scored? Who will be on strike for the next delivery? And what are the signals to be made to the scorers? Please, Abdullah. Thanks for your question, uh, Kartik. So when a, subset, when a uh, fielder comes into, a uh, fielder that returned without permission comes into contact uh, with the ball, so as soon as the ball is uh, touched by that particular fielder, the ball immediately becomes dead. Because the player returned without permission, the uh, bowlers in umpire I needs to award. Abdullah says is only player. So as per appendix, player means nominated player. So I was no. just curious, is it applicable to fielder also, substitute fielder also? Uh, sorry, Tom. I, I didn't hear. The, I didn't hear the question. What did what did yeah. say? No, no. See, like, let me make it clear. The last is player returning without permission. Okay. So to follow all the sequences, uh, and also they have missed out no ball or wide. I mean, in that in that part, if the delivery. So, but uh, I mean, I was in the doubt that what if happens if substitute fielder did that. See, the question is like. Uh, Substitute hmm. fielder return without permission comes in contact with the ball in play after completing two runs yeah. and the cross for third run. OK, so like how many runs shall be scored of this delivery and then who will be on the strike for next delivery and then like what are all the signals mm -hmm. we need to make? 
That's a ball right now. Yeah. Yes, Kartik, I understand what you now what you're asking. So Kartik, the substitute fielder will be treated exactly the same way. So you will apply the law as a player returning without permission. Same punishment apply uh, whether it's a whether it's a substitute fielder as well. So you will apply the punishment by the ball becoming dead as soon as that player touches the ball. Five penalty runs will be awarded to the uh, batting side. Runs completed including the uh, the run if the batters crossed at the instant that the ball became dead, i.e. when that fielder touched the ball. So in your question, you said that the batters crossed at, uh, already crossed at the instant that the fielder touched the ball. So that will be three runs in total. So together, there will be eight runs in total. Five penalty runs. And three three runs, so eight three runs to the batter, so eight in the total. How do you signal this? You will signal the five penalty runs to the scorers, and you'll wait for uh, acknowledgement. The, sco the, the scorers should have seen that three uh, um, runs were, were taken. They, um, the the non-striker now needs to face the next ball because they crossed at the instant that the ball was touched. So the non-striker will face the, the next ball. So there's no one signal that you will signal to the scorers and you're not going to signal five penalty runs and three. Um, you will... Uh, hope, hopefully the scorers will dot it down as they will see the five penalty runs. So will the, they will dot that down in the in the book. Um, they will see the three runs, uh, um, the batters that ran three runs because the non-striker will be on strike. But you do need to make a note in your book. And at the next interval, just go double check the, the, the over number and the ball number that uh, the scorers has recorded it correctly. Five penalty runs on that particular ball and the three runs towards the striker, eight runs altogether from that particular ball. Thanks, Tom. Okay, thank you. Will you be covering appendix in this class or level one or level two or level three further? We have appendix given in the end, right? No, we do not cover the appendices, um, Karthik, although as you have seen uh, with the creases uh, law that we covered last week, we do show some appendices during the presentation, but we're not going to uh, at the end of the presentation go through every part of the appendices. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tom and Abdullah. You're welcome. Uh, ladies and gents, we have reached the end of the presentation as well as the end of the uh, questions in the chat box. Are there any further questions uh, related to the course material covered this evening or the exam? Um, if not, if they are, please uh, raise your hand now. Um, if not, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your uh, participation and your interaction. Uh, these questions and answer sessions are how we all learn and clear up any um, doubts in our minds as to the application of the laws covered. So thank you very much for attending. I shall send out the recording of the lecture in the next hour and a half or so and we shall all reconvene uh, next week Tuesday because uh, Abdullah will be umpiring a match next week Monday night. Um, I will send you all a link so that we can all watch Abdullah together next week Monday night and I will also send you a link to the lecture for Tuesday um, on the same email on um, Monday afternoon. So have a great weekend when it comes. Thank you and good night. Yeah, thank you both. All the best, Abdullah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone. Good night. Have a good evening. Bye everyone.
Thank you. Bye.